and welcome to Cure America with Star Parker. I'm Jonathan Alexander sitting in this week for Star Parker. And we're entering into the second consecutive week of our election coverage, sort of a special election time for us. And if you're like me, you come off the high of the summer months and then you anticipate the holiday season. But right smack dab in the middle of that are these midterm elections and these governor races all across the country. And so we're going to delve right into those numbers and see what is bringing individuals to the voting booth. And when asked, over 79 percent of individuals say the economy is very important to their vote. 70 percent say the future of the democracy is very important. 64 percent say health care. 63 percent say energy policy. 61 percent say violent crime. Another 61 percent say gun policy. 57 percent say the abortion issue is important to their vote. Well, with us now is a man who is rightly recognized as one of the country's leading political strategists when it comes to polls. He's a partner and former president at the Terrence Group, Ed Goes. Uh, thank you for joining us this oh, week. Oh, thanks for, for having me on. Certainly. And, and the Terrence Group is one of the most respected polling uh, companies successfully having Republicans survey and research for well over 30 years now. It's working with strategy teams all across the country. I think right. you have more uh, than 45 or so congressional, either on the Senate or House side, right. and five governors. So your work is really steeped into polling. And I sort of can understand the work that you do. But to our viewers, explain what polling is all about, why polls are important, and why you got into this work uh, yourself specifically. Well, um, polling is, um, if you will, the pollster is the intelligence officer of the campaign. Um, I grew up an army brat, so I always think in those terms. Um, and, uh, you know, your job is to take a pulse of the people, mm -hmm. what the issues are, but also to look at where the campaign is um, in terms of the name awareness of the candidate, the image of the candidate, the opponent. You know, every campaign is about uh, your strengths and your weaknesses versus their strengths and their weaknesses. So something as simple as name recognition and the appearance of the candidate or things that you'll tabulate? It, it so does. I mean, certainly this is an environment that we've seen, uh, especially in the spring, we we're seeing a real big push in the, in the Republican direction. And so there were candidates that maybe didn't have quite the name ID yet, but the, the environment was pushing them into a competitive position um, that I often talk about. They have to grow into the numbers as opposed to, that's the starting point to go up from there. And we're seeing probably for the first time in the last two weeks the debate stage, right? Individuals that are paired up or matched up against their opponents, providing contrasting views to how they will bring this country forward. And so do you, do you, do you see polling shift after they get a face-to-face -face with the candidates or with town halls? And not, not really. I mean, first of all, the viewership of, of most debates is very, very, very low. Um, so folks are watching sports games rather than... Uh, well, they're debates. watching anything but, okay. quite frankly. Um, uh, the big movement comes from how the press plays it afterwards, uh -huh. and that becomes very important. And that's why very often you see candidates um, kind of hammering on the same talking point of they're either fighting for this or they're against that or they're for this, uh, because that's the message they want to get out. So the debate stage is turning into sound right. bites more than the actual issues. But when you... And it, it also comes at a time when the campaigns are at their height in terms of media. Oh. Uh, and something I've seen with the press is that they have gotten increasingly aggressive in July and August, because they know once you get into September, their megaphone is much smaller compared to what the campaigns have in terms of their message. And so if they're going to have an impact, they try to get that impact then. Um, and so you're seeing in, in these campaigns sort of ramping up. We're just a few weeks away and early voting already beginning. Some of these numbers of what are taking folks to the polls, 79% uh, I think is the highest number I've seen saying that the economy is very important. The reason that they're going to the polls is for the economy. Is that a trend that you'll see uh, from that July, August time where the campaigns really had the megaphone? Is that, is that trend No, we, um, it's the number one concern by the voters. I mean, the economy is not in good shape. Um, it's not been in good shape for a while. Um, I've been a little bit surprised, quite frankly, by the Democrats because our experience, my experience, uh, going as recently as 1992, 
I guess it's not that recent, but you know George George Bush when he was running for re-election and and uh, Clinton had the the message of it's the economy stupid. Mm -hmm. What we saw was that there was good economic numbers in August and September and October, and we tried to highlight that. But if there's still bad economic numbers, the voters' view is disconnected. And I think that's one of the mistakes the Democrats were making in terms of the economy. Um, what we have seen in polling is that you need six solid months of good economic news with no bad economic news for the voters to move to saying the economy is doing better. That, that's a high bar for, for any country, especially coming out of the inflation numbers that we're seeing, six solid months of growth without a downturn. I, I, I see those numbers sort of being not reality or, or skewed. It sort of brings me back to a question of polls generally. Are we seeing an accurate representation of the voters when we read polls? Do we? It, 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 it depends on the poll. Okay. Um, I think uh, in the 2012 campaign, the Obama campaign after the election, said, well, we knew what the electorate was, and we campaigned to that electorate. And they said we did a better job of turning out the voters. Well, both can't be right. Either you did a better job of turning out your voters, or you knew what the electorate was and campaigned to them. Mm -hmm. um, so the that, problem was is that public polls then began pulling their sample based on what they thought the electorate would be, because that was cheaper than going through the process of some of the other measurements you use to get, make sure you're getting the likely voters so that, that you're looking at. So there are ways of shortcutting what polls are, how you reap the information? From oh, yeah. They, they, they basically say there's going to be, you know, like a lot of the polls now are saying 55 percent are going to be women. Mm -hmm. um, it's more like 52 percent, and then you kind of go from there. Um, uh, what we know is seniors move from being about 25% of the electorate in a presidential year to being 40% of the electorate in a non-presidential year. Um, Democrats try to ignore that because so many seniors are more our voters. Mm -hmm. um, they also ignore the fact that the youth vote drops off in the non-presidential year, and yet that's their biggest segment of voters right now. So we're, when we're looking at those polls, I, I can see why the, the intelligence officer within that campaign or the candidate themselves would want to know the numbers in front of them. As you said, in 2012, that kind of skewed how uh, the Obama presidency would have viewed their voters. Right. But the average citizen that's looking at a polls, what do you take from it? On, you know, on my end, it's, it's usually the 51 to 49 percent that I care about. What's in the majority? But in general, when you pick up a poll, what should you look for and how should that inform uh, your well, next path? Well, the, the first thing, and, and Real Clear Politics does do a good job of kind of weeding out the ones that are geared too much one direction or the other. Okay. And they do an average of all the polls. Sometimes that's affected by do they have the best group of polls mm -hmm. in their average they're doing or do they have some, some people off on the side. Um, but what we do in our polling and what a lot of the public polls don't do anymore is every question we look at intensity because intensity factors in. When we do a survey, um, we only take out those voters who say they're definitely not going to vote, which is usually about five, six, seven percent of the voters. Okay. And then we interview everyone else. How, can I just ask, how are those interviews done? Are they exit polls or are there? No, they're they all, all live on the phone. Okay. Um, we're, we're, you know, we're moving to a point that about 60% of our interviews are on cell phones. But we believe very strongly in live. Um, one of the things we've seen with the electronic polls where it calls is seniors who are very polite, um, once they kind of figure out that it's a robot that's asking them the questions, yeah. then they hang up. Okay. Um, but they wouldn't do it on you or I if we were on the phone. Of course. Um, so having that live is very important. But the other is we don't weed out, make guesses and weed people out. What I do is every respondent has a score based on intensity to vote, intensity for the candidates, age and education, the two top determinants of turnout. And so every respondent has a score, and then I have my computer guy give me the 100% of the sample, but the 70, 60, 50, 40% most likely to vote. And so I'm looking at all turnout levels. I'm looking at high, medium high, medium low, and low turnout. And then you... you and, and to see if there's together. a break. You know, sometimes you see no break between high turnout and low turnout. And other times you see a real break 
in those numbers. If I'm if I'm picking up the results of those polls and I see 70 percent of voters are looking for a change in the democracy or they're not comfortable with the direction mm -hmm. of the democracy, how do I interpret that? The 63 percent that are dealing with energy policy as their priority, what what does that tell me in the voter? Sam? in one of those numbers or categories, uh -huh. or, or I think differently, that other issues. How, how do well, we that's where it comes into, um, uh, one of the other things we do is we don't ask a lot of new questions. Okay. Um, we tend to ask on key questions that we know is important for the electorate. We ask the same question in the same order, so that we know asking this question before this question has this impact. Uh, the best example I can use is ballot test. Okay. Um, Basically, what we have found over the years for incumbents is what you see is what you get. So if an incumbent's at 49% and the challenger is showing at 30% and the press will write a story about how that candidate is so far behind, in reality, that incumbent's probably within the margin of error of 49%. All right, let's, let's break that down quickly. You say ballot test, that's how they appear? That's where you ask who you're gonna vote for. Okay. And we give the party and we give the candidates names. And so incumbent is you know, right under the majority number, but you'll have a well, challenger that's if they're below. below. Okay. You know, so, so we always, if we're working with an incumbent, for example, if we see that incumbent on the ballot at 48%, we get very concerned about where the campaign is and what we need to do to push them over 50%. Is that, margin of, is that because of the margin of error that they... No, it's just basically what you see is what you get, is that, that the, the, the incumbent has a very high name ID, so anyone that's not voting for them straight out has already taken a step away from them. It's good to know. They may have stepped away to be for another candidate. They may have stepped away to be undecided. Lack of enthusiasm. But, but what we find with those undecideds is they either end up voting against the incumbent or they end up staying at home. How do we factor in certain things like October surprises? I think we had a sort of a, a summer surprise, not really a surprise, a summer anticipation where the abortion numbers kind of skewed how individuals would vote. You saw an uptick in individuals saying abortion now is going to be the topic that brings them to the polls. But how do we factor in for some of these late surprises? They can be named or unnamed, but some of these things that come later into the game that may change what the numbers were, say, at this time or a little earlier on. Well, I think the analysis after the election is going to be that the Democrats were in such a deep problem with, with, with the economy uh, going through the spring. We were seeing some of the worst numbers we've ever seen on right direction, wrong track, on job approval of Biden, on every issue that we looked at, that they jumped on the abortion issue. They jumped on it thematically their way. Okay. And they talked about it too early, too much, and, and too quickly. So you think they sort of overplayed their hand? They overplayed their hand. The other is that we sat back and said, okay, assuming they're overplaying their hand, assuming we're within that six month time period that the economy is gonna come back, mm -hmm. what's another issue we can throw in there that in fact will come into play as the abortion issue fades a little bit and they refocus on the economy. And the answer we came up with is every bad economy always has rising crime. Oh, it seems, and so, it seems and, sort of full circle there that the economy plays on how crime is. Those numbers are, are still pulling at, at the top of where individuals are concerned. You do have surprises every now and then that may have shifted focus, but if pollsters aren't doing their due diligence and really working through the issues, you can see how polls come out skewed. We're, we're a little bit over time and so just as sort of a last word what okay. would you <laughs> caution or advise individuals when it comes into this voting season uh, when they're reading the polls what should they take out of that um, look at them for a, a, um, a grain of salt okay. to some extent um, uh, the reality is the public polls are done for stories um, um, and the best example I can give you is in 2016 uh, when there was talk about all the polls being wrong and the national polls actually ended up being right. Mm -hmm. She won by two points. The polls were saying she'd win by three points on the popular vote. But all the state polls were wrong. But the state polls stopped polling on the Tuesday before the Tuesday election. And guess what happened during that time? It was a huge... The FBI report came out and I was in five key states and watching from Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, oh, it moved from Trump being down to Trump being ahead. And that all changed after they stopped polling. So, well, Ed, thank you so much for, sure. for the clarity that you provided the situation. Of course, we're going to have you back, and we'll have all of you back here right at the end of this message. Stay tuned.
I know it's not my words that helps a person, it's God's word. It's the power of the gospel. God sent his son, Jesus Christ, from heaven to this earth to take our sins. But on the third day, God raised his son to life. The Bible says, but he wants everyone to come in repentance. But you ask Christ into your heart, he'll give you that strength, he'll give you that power. But you've got to be willing to say, God, help me. By faith, trust Jesus Christ. Welcome back, folks. Thank you for sticking with us. Here to break down the numbers that we heard just a little deeper are two friends of yours, two friends of Cure, of course, uh, Richard Manning, the president of Americans for Limited Government, and Raheem Williams, policy analyst here at Cure. Richard, I'll start with you. There's a lot there in terms of polls and numbers, and so I'll just ask a flat question. What are voters going to the polls for? They're going to pull to the polls because the grocery bills are too high, the gas bills are too high, and they attribute those that inflation to the federal government, to the Biden administration, and they they really are sick to death of having to make a choice of what, what they're going to buy at the grocery store and what they're going to have to put back. So that 79 percent number that we're hearing of folks saying, hey, it's the economy that's bringing me out, that old adage, it's the economy, stupid, That that's across the board, folks are really hurting. That, that is, that is the, the primary driver. There's a lot of other issues that matter, but in terms of the single most important issue that the, that the Democrats can't do anything about, their policies drove up gas prices. Their policies then drove up food prices because of the kind of a chain effect that they had. And, you know, they that's what they campaigned on. It's what they promised would happen when they went with the Green New Deal. And now they're eating the bitter fruit of their own policies. Raheem, are, are you seeing that? I mean, is that, I mean, if, if 1992 folks are still voting on the economy, we're here, you know, two decades later, and that's still the primary issue. Is that, has that been consistent through the summer? Are folks just fed up with what they're paying? And so... I believe it is. Uh, everybody is going to be voting their pocketbooks because okay. that's I, I need to feed my family. I have to pay rent, and rent skyrocketing along with uh, gas prices, and that's also because Biden and the Democrats extended those uh, moratoriums on evictions. Is, is All that, of this is adding up. To, it's bad policy, and now every single one is paying for it, regardless of how you vote. Is that resonating? Do folks see the connection between raising prices and mismanaged policy? Are they seeing the connection there? And it, it's hard not to. Okay. Uh, we were all told that inflation would be transitory by uh, the D.C. elites, and it only got worse and worse and worse. And that obviously puts the opposition party, which is mostly now the Republican Party, in a very, very good position with voters because they were calling it out early while elites on the left were pretending it wasn't happening. One of the things you just mentioned, Green New Deal, is is that the case? Are we so, or the Biden administration, so concerned with things that might be out of, of, our, of our control? Uh, not literally looking at the immediate effects of the economy, have what the Biden agenda well, done just been so well, out of pocket that it really is affecting our economy in the way yeah, that the name is telling us. Yeah, I understand. The high gas prices are a feature of the Biden policy. They're not a flaw. Okay. It's what was intended. The objective is to try to move people off of gasoline-driven cars so, so, into electric. So, so they want the gas prices. So that's, what they're, that's actually what their intent was. Wow. And as a result... Everything else that comes with it, um, they just didn't anticipate how high inflation would go, or how fast, and how, how fast it would go there. How much folks in, in terms of in terms of general, the reason that it, the economy always matters most is because you and I have to pay bills. Right. You know, if you're trying to get a new home and you're sitting there saying, "Wait a second, interest rates, mortgage interest rates are six, seven percent now. They were three a year ago. Right. You know, you look at gas prices, you look at the, the totality of what you're having to spend. The average American has lost the equivalent of 3.3% uh, of their income this year because the average American got about 5% raise, but they have an 8.3% increase in inflation. And so people are falling further and further behind. And the general sentiment is, the harder I work, the further I fall behind. And that's scary. But student loans have been forget right? There are all these things coming to the Biden administration. You know, we're, we're supporting a war across the sea in Ukraine, sending billions of dollars there. 
Biden is still touting that we had a good July or a good August. Is, is that true, Raheem, or are folks seeing through what the policies that they've put in place and, and how it's resulting? So a lot of interesting things happened this year. I think uh, when particularly the Dobbs decision uh, reversing Roe v. Wade came out, a lot of pollsters and pundits wrongfully attributed that to a rise in the polls for Democrats. At the exact same time, there was a bear market rally in the stock market, so it looked like things were looking better there. Gas prices were also declining. You had strong job for supports. And Biden had won some legislative uh, accomplishments on some priorities for him and the Democrats. So they came, Democrats came out of the summer looking a lot better. But reality that's where in. the good news stopped and reality set yeah, in. Talk, talk a bit about that. So the, we saw a bump in polling when it came to the abortion issue, where that was starting to pull a little higher than it was, of course, for the Dobbs decision. And that really hasn't changed. Are, are these social issues starting to meet these, you know, these other economic or inflation related issues? I don't believe they are. I think they're important to a lot of voters. It's important to me and especially uh, my colleagues here at Cure. But at the end of the day, uh, I have to agree with uh, James Carville, Louisiana native. It's the economy, stupid. People are going to vote their pocketbooks. Everybody understands money and they understand when they're getting less bang for their buck. One of the things on that about it's all, once again, as, as Ed Goes was saying, it's about intensity. And so if you sit there and you care deeply about abortion and you don't care, you know, it becomes, it outweighs other issues. If you care deeply about your gun rights, it outweighs other issues. If you care about the ability to have speech in the public square and see that being under attack, that outweighs other issues. So it's somewhat simplistic to say overall the economy is it. As a, and an aggregate it is, but the fact is the people who are watching this broadcast, the issues that matter to them from a, from a religious perspective, from a religious freedom perspective, those issues, if those are what animate them and their friends to go out and vote, that vote is as important as somebody who's voting based on you know the price of tomatoes at the, gro sure. you know, at the grocery store. And, and some, some of the numbers reflect that as well. So energy policy, as you mentioned, but also gun policy, violent crime, the abortion issue, mm -hmm. free speech. It, it seems that when the culture is reacting sort of emotionally to a subject, they'll react emotionally to a social issue. That's why protesters take to the street. That's why we saw Jane's revenge and, and sort of these outward reactions to socially emotive issues. Mm -hmm. Is it because the American sort of has a resilience when it comes to the economy and say that there is work that I can do? I can sort of move myself past this point of economic struggles, but then realizing that no, the efforts that I could make two years ago aren't matching up to the amount of spending or taxation that I'm getting now. And so that frustration in that, well, here's one thing that I do have control over, the money I make or, or my ability to save, that's just being trounced on by these negative Biden economic policies. Is that why, despite these social issues being very important, we're still seeing the economy rise to that level of, of this well, is what's bringing the voter to the polls? So humans are complex beings, right? I don't agree with everything uh, a Republican or conservative candidate says, uh, and most, most Democratic voters don't agree with everything the candidates in front of them are saying, but we all understand money. That, there's no way around that. Money talks, right? And, 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 and BS walks. <laughs> so uh, it's important. And um, again, I can't stress this enough. I think voters are doing the same calculus you and I are doing. I, I read this op-ed uh, in New York about mm -hmm. Lee Zeldin, and it, it was, I'm a pro-choice Democrat, and I'm voting for the Republican for wow. governor because they're so upset with the crime That's issue. Wow. You think about crime, it's out of control. Right, numbers voters are, see that. 77% say that. That's, they've seen an increase in crime, and you have a Biden FBI DOJ saying, no, the numbers are the same that right. they've always been. And it's, it's, it's First of all, it's not true when they're saying that. But there's a there's a saying in politics that really simplifies it. If there's a fight, if you if there's a dog fight, you're in your living room. There's a dog fight in the street. You might look out the window. Okay. If there's a dog fight on your front porch, you might sit there and go to the door and look. Figure but if that, that dog way. fight's in your lap, you have to get involved. There when there's crime in your street, the dog fight's in your lap. When your kids go walking to school is in danger, you have to get involved. When, those are the times when you sit there and you say, "Wait a second, I don't like what's going on. It's scary. My I, my status, where I am, my yeah. my." state of being has changed as a result of the stimulus. We're, we're, and people respond to that. And in cities like New York, their subways, their, their subways, gas stations in Pennsylvania. subways, which are now be called Murder Express, by the way. Um, and so we've got, so people are rightfully 
acting on things that directly, uh, directly impact them. And that's one of the reasons why you're seeing a shift, at least in the polls, a shift in the attitudes of people who are Hispanic and how they're voting, a shift in the attitudes of people who are black and how they're voting. And that shift might be minor, but when you take in an aggregate, a one, two, three percent shift in those votes has a massive impact because across the board, across the board, more, more, as it were, Republicans get into power. Say, say we have a majority. Say this is January yeah. 2023, and we're in the majority. What do the Republicans put out instead of playing defense? Now that they're in their governing role, what's that first hundred days look like? What's the first hundred days of a Lee Zeldin, as you mentioned, in New York? What, what are the priorities that Republicans aren't just campaigning against now, but now have to campaign for in terms of their governing authority? Well. I actually see an awful lot of value in playing defense. We have to stop the bad that's happening. So you see what's going on with the Biden energy policies. You see what's going on with crime. And a lot of that stuff is local. So Republicans need to be listening to uh, their state attorney generals, the local DAs, and asking, what can we do here in Washington? I am not a top-down man. I don't believe that the best government comes from um, edicts issued in the Hall of Congress. Uh, politics is local, and we should never, ever forget that. So what Republicans need to do is listen to the people that are on the front lines very important. every single day. Uh, so I think that's the first step, because we've seen our, our, our uh, president, who's very much aloft yeah. <laughs> often, uh, going with whatever activists tell them. Act but the fact of the matter, as pointed out, uh, black people want to be safe in their communities. Right. We don't want to defund the police. Yeah, that's, that's, uh, we want financial security as well. We want to be able to provide for our families. That's not a black white thing. That's an American and thing. You're saying that that is a local control that comes exactly. from people having those solutions within their own community. There is a role for Congress, though, if we change. And I'll ask you just quickly: Do you believe the numbers are going to be as as big as victory pickup for Republicans, or are, are we going to be? I think on the congressional level, the Republicans. Uh, will have a very, very good day. Okay. What, and, what, what do we do with that good day? And the answer is, if you have, if the Republicans pick up 25 seats in the House, mm -hmm. not much, because they won't have a big enough majority to be able to actually wield power. They'll be able to stop stuff, but they won't really be able to push much through. Okay. If you're looking at 240 Republicans in the House, so they've got about you know, a 22 vote majority. If you get there, at that point, you can actually do stuff. And the things they'll do is they'll, they'll use the power of the purse to important. try to deal with the border. You know, deal, force the Biden administration to deal with the flow, flow of the border. They'll use the power of the purse to stop some of the attacks through the education department against local school districts to attack, to push cultural agenda that's an anathema to the American people. So they're going to be able to use that power of the purse, and that's how they're going to be able to get stuff done. Um, but it's a matter of whether or not they have, how big of a majority they get. Well, one of the, the defining roles and responsibilities of Congress is holding on to the purse. You have the National Defense Authorization Act that will come as soon as the elections are over. You also have a continuing resolution that will end up in December. Um, hopefully it's a Republican majority in January that will be controlling the purse. But at the same time, there's that local control. There's the local issues that start at the kitchen table that may meter on into uh, the streets around you and your daily commute coming back and forth, depending on what city you live in. Those are local issues that can be addressed and ought to be addressed with the individuals that are there locally. You see how important the votes are. We've heard about the polls will hurt. We've heard about how it will impact and affect Americans on a daily basis. When we come back, we'll deal with just another issue with health care and then bring our panel back after our break. So stick with us, folks. Today, a student in public school will pray or lead a Bible study. Today, a pastor will preach boldly the truth of the scriptures without fear of the IRS. Today, the life of an innocent child will be saved, and a mother will experience the joy of a newborn baby. A distraught woman will find hope and choose life rather than death. Today, there is a strong voice defending God's created natural order of marriage and family. There is a defender of freedom in the courtroom and in the halls of Congress and in legislative bodies across the land. Today, all of this is possible because of the Ministry of Liberty Council. People from all over America will find help and hope because of Liberty Council. The adversity they face will be turned into victory. Case by case, law by law, person by person, Liberty Council is advancing religious freedom, the sanctity of human life, and the family through litigation, education, and public policy. And that is the mission of Liberty Council, to restore the culture by advancing life, liberty, and family.
Welcome back, folks. I'm Jonathan Alexander sitting in once again for Star Parker. One of the issues that are still ranking pretty high is health care and the rising price of health care. And it seems to be one of those issues that isn't quite soundbitey or there isn't really a talking point that surrounds health care. It's because it's complex. It takes a lot of level of analysis to really delve into the subject and know what the best outcome should be. But one thing that often resonates is the price of health care. And with inflation rising, it seems uh, that health care has remained sort of stagnant in the past few years. Well, with us to help us really understand uh, this section of the economy that does deal with health care is Brooklyn Roberts. Brooklyn is an expert from the American Legislative Exchange Council, which is America's largest nonpartisan and voluntary membership organization of state legislatures. They're dedicated to the principles of limited government, free markets, and federalism. In that capacity, uh, Brooklyn Roberts is a senior director of Health and Human Services Task Force. Uh, so thank you for joining us, Brooke. Thanks for coming on the show. Thank you for having me. Uh, so tell us a bit about yourself. So you're a native of Alabama. Is that where you were born and, and raised? Yes, I'm a, um, from Alabama, Roll Tide. Nice. So. <laughs> um, and I you know, went to law school and kind of got involved with my local Republican Party. And it just, uh, the policy issues are what drew me. I was a philosophy major in undergrad, yeah. and that first, uh, you know, political philosophy class that I took really kind of opened your eyes. Yeah, a lot, yeah, it got me hooked. Yeah, I think a lot of folks are in that situation, probably especially now. There's, you know, a GOP county, probably right where folks are living, and that first taste of hey, I can really actually make a difference and speak to the policies that are happening locally. But you're doing this now as sort of a national perspective, but also working with state legislatures on the ground. What what's that sort of like? The work of Alec itself. Are you pulling from state legislatures on both sides of the aisle? We do. Um, we are nonpartisan, so we do work with Democrats and Republicans. And um, it, it's very interesting to work with state legislators from across the country because they all kind of have different. Um, different issues that are really important to them and they have different you know circumstances and dynamics in their district so I mean, um, yeah, certainly makes I mean some of these national issues are you know across the board people talk about the economy but then you know you have a bridge that goes up that stops the flow of traffic in one specific sector of a state that no one at the national level is paying attention to but it affects traffic times and folks getting back home to their kids so some of these really close to home issues is, is what I like state legislators being a part of and it's it's great that that you guys are able to help influence. Uh, one of the topics, as we mentioned, is health care. So as rising prices of inflation uh, seem to affect every area of the economy, health care has remained stagnant in its prices. Have, have health care prices changed at all, even in this inflation season? Um, they're just now really starting to. Okay. So uh, the most recent report, uh, Consumer Price Index report that was released, has healthcare uh, inflation rate going at 6%. Okay. So a year ago today, it was at 0.44%. So is, that's. Which is really good. That's probably the best market. One of them, yeah. And yeah. so that's a huge jump. And I think you're just now kind of. Seeing that go up uh, because of the conditions uh, that are kind of unique to the healthcare market. Okay, what, we'll talk about those conditions. But what does that actually mean? A jump from zero to six percent. How will we be seeing that? Is that bills that we're getting from hospitals? Is that the price of certain pharmaceuticals? What does that jump from 0 0.04 to six percent look like practically? I think you're going to see it in. Um, Copays, premiums, deductibles, um, and so these are out-of-pocket costs. Out-of-pocket costs. Um, I think that's where most Americans are, are really going to feel it. And, and so, what do we do in response to that? Is is it going to be a nationwide sort of jump, or are seeing different sectors of the country experience this more than others, or? I think it's more of a nationwide, um, a nationwide kind of jump, um, and I think you know, you mentioned that all politics are local, mm -hmm. but um, healthcare is a very much you know a local personal issue. Absolutely. So I, I do think it will have an impact. So, so how do we respond to this? So state legislators that are hearing from their constituents that I'm paying more in premiums. We sort of had that talk maybe two or three years ago when premiums were skyrocketing, places like Arizona and Oklahoma, as a result of the Obamacare policies before we had the employer and individual mandate uh, be stricken out uh, through Trump policies. You, you really saw that jump, and then you didn't really hear that subject anymore. So 
now that state legislatures are starting to hear it again, what sort of policies are you suggesting to these local state legislators to help combat that price level change in healthcare policy? I think uh, price transparency is uh, really going to be important going forward for consumers and, and patients um, across the country because I think we need to know what we're paying for our health care. Okay. Um, health care is one of the only sectors in our economy where you're expected to um, buy the service before you actually know what it costs. That's actually true. Yeah, you, you don't get a menu of items no. <laughs> with, with a price tag attached. It's usually the bill comes later. Some, some industries you sort of have that, you know, you get your car fixed and they'll tell you later on, well, this is what we had to fix. Um, but there's sort of a margin of error. You can sort of negotiate, this is where I want my price point to be. You're saying healthcare is not like any of those other industries. You're after the fact getting a bill at home, right. sometimes much more than you can afford. Exactly. And um, while there, are, you know, often is some room to negotiate, I think you've got a lot of Americans that are, you know, weighed down by medical bills and medical debt. How, how do we fix that? So one of the more pejorative responses to a debate that happened in Georgia was uh, Raphael Warnock, Senator Warnock, saying, well, we've done great in bringing down insulin prices. Herschel Walker then said, well, we also have to worry about the front end of health care, having people be healthier so that they're not reliant on certain pharmaceuticals. And that conversation sort of gets you know, distorted. What are we seeing in terms of healthy choices and folks looking for alternatives to the standard, I have to go to the urgent care, I have to go to the doctor's office, or some of these natural remedies or natural uh, patterns of life that people can adopt to help combat what we are going to see rising health care costs. I think being healthy on the front end is very important. Um, you are starting to see programs now like direct primary care, which okay. make it easier for people to access um, preventative health care, um, regular checkups, vaccines. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, that's important for people because it will save money in the long run. Okay, so these are folks taking, you know, taking control of their health, even on the front end. And of course, they're, they're all often catastrophic issues that, that you can never predict or even prevent in certain cases. How do folks react to that? How do you anticipate what you're going to be paying for if, if the situation doesn't even occur? And how do state legislatures in their policy, how do they navigate some of these very um, you know, back and forth issues where there isn't much clarity on the front end? Well, I think a large part of it uh, could be solved or, or at least helped by um, more transparency. And so one of the you know things that we've encouraged our state legislators to do and, and have model, a model policy actually on is um, hospital price transparency. So allowing um, patients to see that menu and see those prices before they get the service. Uh, that's especially important if you have a deductible um, because you want to know on the front end, hey, this is what it's going to cost me to do this, and, and this is how much I'm going to owe. And so getting that information out. Now, um, the Affordable Care Act required hospitals to post that information. And uh, during the Trump administration, he actually clarified with a, an executive order that required you know it to be posted online in searchable databases. We're seeing state legislators now start to codify that okay. and into state law so that they can actually enforce it. Um, so this is disclosing, even on their websites, but disclosing to the patient, you're walking in for the service, this is how much you're going to pay on the front end. That, so that's one particular uh, pillar of your suggested policy, this transparency. Is there, is there any, I would ask, how are the hospitals responding to that? I mean, it's, it's, it's fluid. Doctors have to get paid. They have to keep their lights on. How, what's the reaction from the hospital industry in terms of some of these policy legislations that, that are now being imposed on them? Well, considering that only about 16% of hospitals in the nation are compliant with the with the federal law, I would it's, say they're not replying well. well. Yes. Okay. Um, and wow. that's why I think a lot of state legislators are looking at ways to, um, to to enforce that through the state. Uh, we worked with Virginia this year um, with uh, Representative Dan Helmer, who is a Democrat, and um, we passed that. It was almost unanimous in both houses. Um, Texas, uh, Colorado recently passed a bill that uh, prevents hospitals from going into medical debt collection if those pr prices were not posted on the front end. Okay, so, th so these are purple states that are at least taking this approach that unanimous in Virginia that we, we all want this sort of transparency. 
um, but also red states in Texas as well. On that last point on debt collection, is that another pillar in your proposed policy? So this is after the fact, you're getting the bill at home. Families are just saying, this, I cannot touch this bill. This will never get paid. And you have aggressive debt collectors that only benefit based on how much they can reap from that bill that can't get paid. Is there attention paid in your policy to these aggressive debt collectors and how they treat hospital bills? I think we're looking at preventing that on the front end, preventing that bill from ever being incurred. So, um, but you, you're correct. Uh, I think about 64% of Americans now are in some type of medical debt. Um, and Those are huge numbers. Huge, um, almost almost that many have delayed or, or foregone care because they were concerned about costs. So, so these are individuals that need the health care, can't afford it, and saying, "Well, I, I'm never going to be at that point, or I can't now be at that point, so I'm going to delay this either preventative or maintenance or corrective surgery that or procedure that I'm getting because I just can't afford that." So that that's a very personal issue. That's you know kitchen sure. table, but but personal issue. Is that sort of how Alec? policies come about? Are you looking to the voter, what they're concerned about, what's affecting the everyday issue, and saying, well, let's build policy based on what individuals are needing and requesting of their government? Um, because we are a membership organization, our, you know, the, the topics and the policies that we work on are really driven by our members okay. and our state legislators in particular. Um, we are listening to them in terms of what they're hearing from their constituents and, and things that their constituents are concerned about. And so that's kind of how we are, are building our agenda there. All right. And it's strong to have good state legislatures. They're the first representative body, other than probably the school board or the, or, the, or the county commissioners, they're the first ones representing, I think in most states, the average is something like 1,300 to 13,000 or, or the small districts that they're representing. The numbers could be maybe a little different, but they're, they're the ones you see in the, in the grocery store. And to have them be the ones that from the ground up are saying we need sort of this policy, um, I think when you're seeing a jump from 0.4% to 6%, it's going to become a national issue. So. Uh, say Republicans get the majority, what from a national perspective, from the federal government level, uh, should be done or can be done in these or in the early months of January to respond to what is obviously going to happen out of the state levels? Well, um, not to harp on the transparency issue too much, but I think that, uh, again, you know, patients knowing what it's going to cost them up front will, and knowing having some accountability, too, in terms of what's being charged. Um, I had an op-ed in the Orange County Register uh, earlier this year, and Scripps Memorial Hospital in L.A. Mm -hmm. was, um, it, it was a leak of documents recently, and it showed that they had a software system that was marking up prices wow. from 575 to 675% automatically, just off the top. So um, some of the documents showed that like an antibacterial solution went from $70 to 400 and something dollars when, you know, when it was charged to the patient. So I think that transparency on, you know, from that standpoint is, is good too because it holds hospitals accountable for what they're charging. And um, we need more enforcement on the federal level. The law is already there. Okay, it was so under the ACA, but we don't have a lot of enforcement. Yeah. So Words that you wouldn't often want to hear, healthcare, price gouging, but now transparency and exposing what can be done and having that fixed. Brooklyn, thank, thank you so much for joining us. If there's a website that you can point individuals to so that they can sort of break down the conversation that we have, what, what's that website? It is alec.org, A-L-E-C.org. Okay, alec.org. -E -E alec Brooklyn, mm -hmm. thank you so much for joining us. Thank you very much. We'll be right back with the panel right after these messages. I know it's not my words that helps a person, it's God's word. It's the power of the gospel. God loves you, but sin separates us from God. God sent his son, Jesus Christ, from heaven to this earth to take our sins. He died on a cross for our sins. He was buried for our sins, but on the third day, God raised his son to life. God is patient with us. He's not wanting anyone to perish. The Bible says, but he wants everyone to come in repentance. And so if you come tonight to Christ, you've got to come willing to turn from your sin. You say, well, Franklin, I don't think I can. But you ask Christ into your heart, he'll give you that strength. He'll give you that power. But you've got to be willing to say, God, help me. I want to change. I want to trust you. By faith, trust Jesus Christ.
Well, I hope you enjoyed our last guest, Brooklyn Roberts, exposing what will probably be the next attention that our state legislatures and all the way up to the federal government will have to pay close attention to, the rising health care costs. At a point, it seems to be neutral, but it's going to match to the inflation costs and affect, once again, another area of our pocketbooks. Uh, she's a familiar face to us, but more familiar faces to us is the panel from earlier that will be joining us again, Richard Manning, president of the Americans for Limited Government, and Raheem Williams, policy analyst for CURE. Bring us back into that last, last segment. What did you hear from health care policy? Is that consistent to what we're anticipating across the board, state legislatures, federal intervention? What did you hear? Inflation is going to hit us and hit Americans in every single aspect, and medical care and health care is no exception. Okay. But we're not going to make meaningful progress on, on medical costs until we address the giant elephant in the room. What, what's the elephant in the room? The American Medical Association. Okay. They've pressured and lobbied medical schools into keeping seats low, restricted the number of doctors. Oh. They fight against scope of practice expansions. Let, let's break that down quickly. And so these are folks applying <laughs> to medical schools that want to be doing the work in hands of Christ and actually helping the physical body. Yes. They're limiting the number of folks that can get into medical school. They have a long tradition and history of doing that. Now they're trying to change their tone, okay. but that takes a while. Okay. So so the question is, why are they so powerful? Or what, what's in their interest of keeping folks out of helping others through the medical field? Oh, doctor pay. We have the highest paid physicians in the world, and it's nowhere near close. Number two is almost half as much in Germany. So, and that's their work. It, until we're willing to stare them down and say, you know what, no more, we're going to actually try market economics in medicine, mm -hmm. no progress is going to be made. Health care costs have always outpaced the regular inflation, and that's going to continue as long as they continue to re rent seek here in the Beltway and politicians collapse to their will. And you're, you're saying there's a bureaucracy, at least the MMA, that's, that's controlling this, as it were. Uh, is that, yeah. is that a federal intervention solution, or well, how, it is, how do we address first some of all, these bodies your, that, that well, have control over our health care? Yeah, let's, health care used to be a state issue. Okay. And when Obamacare passed, it became a federal issue. Wow. The federal government took, up, took over a large part of the economy. The reason that the COVID standards were able to be enforced across the nation and doctors had to follow them was because the people who are paying the freight is the federal government. And because the federal government was saying, no, we're not gonna, we're not gonna do reimbursements on X, Y, or Z, this is how much you're gonna get, they were able to shutter alternative treatments that didn't meet the federal government's dictates. So, so this and so this is a big deal. And one of the things, that if you wanna deal with overall cost, transparency is important, mm -hmm. Brooklyn's right. But ultimately what we need to do is we need to create more competition in the medical insurance market. With what Obamacare did is it basically created monopolies. Okay. And what we need is we need to broaden the medical insurance market to allow insurers to be able to go across state lines. And so we have broad, broad competition. Competition drives prices down you're, every single time. To get in, it is so amazing that that's still a problem. It like, is, isn't it? There is no reason a health insurer in California or Florida shouldn't be able to sell me health insurance in Louisiana or Virginia. We're humans the same way everywhere. It's so not like property insurance. Allow, There's no snow dams to be worried about so on allowing, your roof. You're saying allowing individuals to go shop for their insurance, but there was this 2010 Obamacare passed the Supreme Court a couple times it's, it's, and, and is in the law of the land. You're saying that top-down taking over of the industry is why we're seeing the prices that we're seeing now. The, the, the top-down takeover of the economy is why our health care is worse okay. and our and our costs well, since 2010 have gone up significantly. The other piece of this that people, people sort of need to focus on is preventive care is very important. But remember, what the federal government did to us and the mm -hmm. state, gov state governors did to us is they said, we're not going to allow you to go get a mammogram. We're not going to allow you to oh. go get a colonoscopy. We're not going to allow you to go get a, a regular physical. They denied the preventive, me the preventive care for over a year. And as a um, result of that, based, based on what? What was? Ba well, based on the fact we didn't we shut down all the people who were providing it because we had to focus on COVID. Wow. Okay, and we had to keep hospital beds available for COVID, and so by denying that, we are sicker today because many of the people who didn't get diagnosed mm -hmm. during in 2020, mm -hmm. when they go in mid 2021 and they get diagnosed, what was a stage one is now stage three, wow. and so it's a tremendous problem we're seeing in the death rates, and it's and. Ultimately, our medical system is built on preventive care. 
That's what it's built on. And that was destroyed by the, by the COVID reaction by some of the more aggressive governors, typically left-wing governors. Brian, you're a local control guy. What, what's the re response to that? How do, you, how do you take that out of the federal purview and say, well, these are local issues that ought to be dealt with locally? Well, again, uh, we, there are powerful lobbying forces in D.C. and in the state house. Let's, let's not forget that. Uh, big issue, for example, 35 states still have certificate of need laws that does nothing to improve access or competition or public health outcomes, yet they're still on the books. Wow. There are very powerful forces that make a lot of money to keep very bad policy on the books. And until we kick these lobbyists out uh, of D.C., out of our state houses, American health will continue to suffer. So it's, it's, it's a mm -hmm. stand up for the I'll stand up for the lobbyists. Lobbyists, in, <laughs> lobbyists, <laughs> lobbyists inform, inform okay. legislators. They educate. The key is, the, and the key is, Ultimately, we, you break up the, the monopoly on the health insurance end, and suddenly you end up with multiple systems working in a state, and they compete against one another. But and if we can break up that monopoly, we're going to end up with, with less expensive and be able to pick that what we want covered in our life that's relevant to us and not have to pay for. I don't really want to pay for pregnancy coverage. I've passed the point where I'm going to get pregnant. But, but, but Biden had a victory, right? Biden had a victory in terms of capping insulin costs. His Inflation Reduction Act, which I think is ironically named at best, probably, uh, probably an insult. His Inflation Reduction Act had a big portion that says, hey, we're going to reduce the cost of insulin or at least cap it. Isn't that a, a federal response? We're going to cap pharmacy prices? Shouldn't that be a good thing? How come? Is that well, going to work I mean, out in terms of? Well, they, they didn't just do insulin. They did, they did a pass something that was a cap on all, pharm, on all pharmaceuticals is, is as good, it relates to Medicare. Good, is that a good or a bad thing? Um, ultimately, it's a bad thing. And it's a bad thing for this reason. Mm -hmm. um, insulin is a unique situation. So let's take insulin aside. Let's talk about the broad, breadth of pharmaceuticals. In the breadth of pharmaceuticals, the, uh, the best thing is to have, once again, People who are the manufacturers competing on competing, competition, and, and we that's, create that's we create mar we create markets. The the challenge what happens is if they say let's Medicare is what actually the federal government controls, mm -hmm. and let's say under Medicare they make it so it's not Medicare is not going to reimburse for the most for the latest biomed that deals with Alzheimer's. Mm -hmm. Well, the incentive. For the people who actually make those medicines, cost about two billion dollars to bring a medicine to market. Um, the incentive is that they're going to be able to sell it. Right. Yeah. But you'll, if you can't sell it, you know, at, for a rate that is going to make it. So that's that's a free market, basic free market solution and an enterprising. There's uh, also a secondary issue, which is those people that are on these um, assistance programs mm -hmm. also could be denied life-saving medicines if negotiations fail. That happens in the UK all the time where mm -hmm. you're told you're not allowed to have this because we weren't able to come to an understanding. And that's also horrific. So that, that's I, at least, I, we'll I, jump I, out of this talk for a second because that's, I mean, that's clear on the healthcare. I think it's, it's important for our viewers to see as it's always been an issue, but that's probably the next thing that is going to tilt the economy oh, yeah. in, in a way that's disfavorable to individuals. But something you mentioned in a previous segment dealing with energy policy. Here's yeah. another sort of one size fits all that Biden is saying, I'm going to be the czar when it comes to our energy policy, but we're doing things that are crippling the American pocketbook when it comes to our energy policy. Right. Let, let, let's speak to that. Not only the issues that are there, but what can be done about it. Now, I'll just, one thing quickly. So state attorneys generals have the ability of suing the federal government. Yes, do. A lot of them have used that to sue the previous administration, Trump administration, stopping pipelines from going through their states. Is there a response from the state to attack what is some of the bad energy policies that we're seeing? Take that question. Well, I think I think the states have been, many of the attorney generals have been doing that um, related to some of the proscriptions that uh, that deny people the ability to use their property to be able to uh, develop and en develop yeah. energy. I'm, I'm going to just give you a simple thing. Uh, Joe Biden recently has been talking about in, about the need to have more more energy produced. Okay, he wants to shut down all the production. He wants more energy produced. The simple decision to shut down the Keystone XL pipeline, which was bringing no oil across, that Keystone XL pipeline would have been completed in the last month. Wow. And we would have had a massive new supply of oil flowing into our country. 
by, by design, lowering the cost because of volume, the price per barrel. Could have been a and, net, net and exporter. It would have been, we could have been, once again, we could have done, been a net exporter. And you know, recognize, that's Canadian oil, mm -hmm. so we import it, but that was, a, that was a flow that was online, that was scheduled to go on place now. His executive order, Ended that, and and that's what he's doing now with the with the other things. He's saying he's affecting. That's just that's just the tip of the iceberg right. because there's going to be second and third order effects here, right? Because you did that, those companies lost billions in in infrastructure building and wages that were already paid okay. to put that in place. You're telling American energy companies right now not to invest in infrastructure, oh. and they aren't, and that is a problem because we aren't going to have it tomorrow if we continue. And that, that's an excellent point. So these energy companies have to project not five and 10 years on the road like nonprofits do. They're 50 years on the road. This is exactly. infrastructure that's going to be there for me to invest in American energy. But we've cut that out on a day one executive order. And now these folks aren't getting back into the investing on American soil. CEO of, of Chevron said, we're not get, we will never see another um, another refinery wow. built in America because America doesn't want it. But you're telling us you don't want it. So it's not the market. The market wants it. But they're saying because that's a, bi so that's a political that's reality. A, that's that's a political reality, but, but, and it's a. But Biden can go over to Saudis and say, "Hey, keep keep drilling oil, OPEC." We so shouldn't be begging for energy. We should get back to what we were good at, what made us energy independent, which is the all of the above strategy. We need to power our country using every method economically feasible, and that way we can actually allow people in our industries to prosper. I grew up dirt poor. We struggled with the electric bill and sometimes it wasn't there. So when these lofty environmentalists are like, oh, you can pay an extra 20 or 30, I sat in the dark because of that extra right. 20 or 30. For, for $100,000, energy car. matters. And, and, day and day, on day that, one, you're Kevin McCarthy. What's the policy that you put forward to start to reverse some of the many things that we've spoken about? Um, on energy, what I do is I, I say we are going to undo Biden's denial of being able to have surge for energy on federal lands. So we increase the leasing program, not for this year, but for three to five years from now. Um, I, I look at EPA and I say, what are the standards at EPA that are stopping people from expanding our refinery capacity? I go after renewable fuel standard, which is putting small and medium refineries out of business because they have to pay the big refineries that are using ethanol because they're doing heating oil to the heat, to the problem in terms of heating houses. Six million houses in this country depend on heating oil. And right now, we have 26 days of heating oil supply in, our in, our, in, our, in total. That's right. what we winter have. Is yeah, winter is coming. Winter is coming. It's going to be a cold winter. You're in January. You're a Republican majority. What do you do? Well, we got to look at barriers, and particularly I'm going to get a little edgy here. Nuclear. We're, we're falling behind in our investments in nuclear and building in nuclear, and that actually lowers carbon emissions. We need to be smart. I don't understand why Europe is leading in small nuclear reactors. We need to bring that technology here, and like I said, we need to make sure American businesses and families are giving relief with cheap energy prices, because that is what God gave this abundant country to us to do. We have the means to do it, but dumb policy in D.C. is holding us back, and, we, and the Republicans need to identify that. Like I said, there's value in playing defense. A lot of what we need to do is stop the bad and we need to stop it immediately. Raheem, Richard, thank you so much for providing clarity to these situations that affect everyday Americans. At the tail end of these messages, we'll come back with a closing statement for you, our audience. Well, thank you for joining us on what is part two of a several week leading up to these elections. And I'm comforted by the words of Prophet Daniel, who says, seven times shall pass over you until you know that it is God that rules over the affairs of men. He sets up one king and puts the other down. Ultimately, it is his story. It's his providence. And as we live in this constitutional republic, we do have that opportunity to remain engaged in our voting and through these elections. And so let's ensure that when we send men and women to lead over us, that they are seeking first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. And then all these other things, all the other subjects that we mentioned today, those things will be handled as well. We'll, we'll see you next week here on the same channel for Cure America with Sar Parker. Thank you.